I'm a 34-year-old guy, and I went completely radio silent on my fiancé, Jessica, who's 33, after she suggested we have a temporary open relationship before the wedding. I shut that down fast, but she went ahead and cheated anyway. Jessica and I, we've known each other since we were kids. Our parents were close, basically best friends for life, so we practically grew up side by side. We started dating in our teens, and honestly, it felt like our families had already decided for us. They seemed to have more grand plans for us than we ever did. When I was working on my master's degree, I had to move away to another city, while Jessica stayed behind to finish her nursing degree. A year into the long-distance thing, we both agreed it was better to stay friends, so we wouldn't let the relationship tie us down. We dated other people but stayed best friends. The weird thing was, we both kind of always knew we'd end up together again someday, it was just a matter of when. After I graduated, I stayed in the city where I'd earned my degree and got a job in my field. I was waiting for a transfer back home, and when it finally came through, I was over the moon. By then, Jessica had been in a long-term relationship with a guy who seemed decent enough, but I always got the sense he was suspicious of our friendship. I understood why, so I stepped back out of respect, though Jessica and I still chatted a few times a year. At work, I had a boss and mentor named Peter. Let's call him Peter, who was 44 and just an all-around great guy. We became close, and one day, he came down from his cushy office to talk to me. He mentioned an opening for a job in another country that would last two years, and though it wasn't a huge moneymaker, the job covered all living expenses, rent, hotel, travel, you name it. The catch? I'd be based in Tokyo, with some travel to other Asian cities here and there. Peter said it was a tough gig, but it would be a great chance to prove myself and climb the career ladder. I thought about it long and hard, spoke to my friends and parents, and ultimately, I figured why not. I could save most of my salary and gain some valuable experience. Peter said he'd put in a good word with the higher-ups and recommended me for the position. He'd done something similar years ago, and it had really boosted my career. So off I went to Tokyo. That first year was rough, learning the culture, adjusting to the social norms, not just in Japan but in all the other places I traveled for work. One thing that caught me off guard was how much attention I got from women. Everywhere I went, they were practically throwing themselves at me because I was a foreigner. And let me tell you, I took full advantage. These weren't women from some backwater place either. Many of them were highly educated. I had quite a few friends with benefits and was always clear with them that I wasn't interested in anything long-term or serious since I was only there temporarily. What started as a two-year gig ended up turning into three. Peter would visit a few times a year, either for work or vacation, and let's just say we didn't exactly behave like saints. We had some wild times in cities like Angela City in the Philippines, and a few others I probably shouldn't even name. Once my contract was up, I returned home and put a hefty down payment on a house just outside the city. After living in a place with 37 million people, I needed some peace and quiet. I'd been home for about a month, and during one visit to my parents' house, Jessica was there. She had broken up with that guy about a year ago, and we started talking again, more seriously this time. It wasn't long before we started dating. I held off on having sex with her for a while, though, and not because I didn't want to, I really did, but I was terrified of what might happen. See, I developed this habit of being with multiple women during my time in Asia, and I was trying to get a grip on that before things between Jessica and I got too serious. Everyone, including Jessica, knew I dated around, but my social media only had the occasional picture of me with different women. My mom had even called me a whoremaster a few times, and as much as I laughed it off, it stung a bit. Here's where things started to unravel. Jessica and I finally slept together, and let's just say she was, surprised. She flat out said I was different, more experienced, which was her polite way of saying I'd picked up a few tricks. She started asking questions, and I wasn't entirely honest with her. I told her bits and pieces, 
but I didn't give her the full number because, even if I'd halved it, it would have sounded bad. But despite everything, I knew I could be faithful to her. Little did I realize, though, the doubt I planted in her head that night would grow into something much bigger down the road. Of course, our families were thrilled that we were back together. It was always supposed to happen this way, right? Things were going great, and after talking to her parents, I proposed. She moved in with me, and everything seemed perfect. But there were a few things that felt, off. She started asking me if I was truly happy with her, which seemed like a red flag at the time, but I shrugged it off. Fast forward to December 2019. The wedding was planned for June 2020, and we all know how 2020 turned out. Christmas was wonderful, but just before New Year's, we hit the first big disaster. I was sitting at my computer doing some work while Jessica and her cousin Tanya, who's 32 and someone I've known since we were kids, were looking at wedding stuff. Tanya's always been cool with me. Jessica asked if we could talk, and Tanya moved into the living room to give us space. I sat down at the table, ready to hear what was on Jessica's mind. She told me not to interrupt or freak out, which already had me on edge. Then she started talking about how things had changed between us in the bedroom. She said she was worried I wasn't satisfied with her anymore and that eventually, I'd cheat on her. She didn't want our future kids or our relationship to be destroyed if I ever strayed. At that point, I was thinking, great, she's about to break up with me. Just as I thought it couldn't get worse, I heard that little voice in my head, but wait, there's more. Jessica hit me with the real bombshell. She wanted to open up the relationship so she could gain more experience. She claimed this would help her feel less insecure, and then had the nerve to say I shouldn't worry because I was the only man she'd ever truly loved. That's why, she explained, none of her past relationships had led to marriage. I agreed with her on one thing we were the only real loves each other had known. But, of course, I thought she was joking when she mentioned opening up the relationship. I mean, this couldn't actually be happening, right? It's been over a year and a half now, so I'm trying my best to remember the key points. She started saying she'd only hook up with random people, never anyone we knew or worked with. It wouldn't be with the same person more than once, and there'd be no emotional attachment involved. At this point, I was like, what the hell? When it finally hit me that she was dead serious, it felt like my heart just stopped. I didn't know you could actually feel your heart jump into your throat like that, but there it was. Now, I'm not the type to get angry or violent, but I was shouting at this point. And suddenly, it made sense why her cousin Tanya stuck around so close. I yelled, Tanya, did you put her up to this? Tanya just calmly replied that she was there to support Jessica. Great, thanks for that, Tanya. Super helpful. Then Jessica, almost like she was being generous, says I'm free to do whatever I want to, as long as I follow the same rules. I told her flat out no. I was furious, and even thinking about it now makes my blood boil. I made it clear I didn't want some random hookups. I just wanted to be with one person. And when she asked who, I looked right at Tanya, nodded toward her and said, I want to sleep with Tanya. Well, that sure got Jessica's attention. Tanya turned beet red and was clearly uncomfortable. Jessica snapped back immediately, saying no, that was gross, she was family, and we both knew her. It was completely out of line. I mean, really? That was the line for her. At this point it was like I'd entered some alternate universe. None of it made sense. We argued back and forth, and I told her straight up that if she went through with this, we were done. I made it crystal clear that I loved her and was willing to work through anything. But not this. I stormed off, grabbed my pillow, and holed up in the guest room. I could hear them talking downstairs for a while, but I had no idea what they were saying. Honestly, it would have been a funny joke if it didn't drag out into an hour-long conversation. I didn't sleep a wink that night, and when I went to work the next day, I was completely useless. I was a wreck. 
Luckily, Jessica started two weeks of night shifts that same day, so at least we didn't have to see each other for a while. I figured we could both cool off and revisit the whole thing later. Every night, she left dinner for me in the fridge with a little I love you note, and she texted me often, but I kept my replies short and cold. The following Thursday, I was working on my computer, going through some files, when an email notification popped up from her account. It was a reservation for a hotel, one of the nicer ones near my office. I knew the place well because I'd been there a few times with co-workers. My first thought was that maybe she was planning something sweet to apologize, like a night out together. But the next morning came, and she texted me like nothing was up, just asking how my day was. Then she said she was happy she only had one more night of her night shift left. That's when I started to feel sick. How could she be working another night when there was a hotel reservation for that evening? I was stressed out of my mind sitting at my desk. I started searching through dating sites, looking for anonymous profiles without pictures, trying to find any clue. Nothing. Then Peter, my boss, popped in and saw that I was a total mess. He asked what was going on, so I spilled the whole story. Peter's one of those men go their own way types, but he's always been supportive of my relationship with Jessica. He suggested we grab lunch at the hotel restaurant where the reservation was. He showed the. No. Not that place. He didn't know about the hotel part, so we went to a different spot for lunch. But I couldn't eat a thing. I couldn't even drink. I was that sick to my stomach. Peter told me I couldn't work like this and suggested I take some time off, whether it be paid or unpaid. I told him I just couldn't go back home. I didn't even want to see Jessica at that point. A part of me still wanted to believe none of this was real. I rushed home, packed as much of my stuff as I could into my car, and drove back to the office. That's when Peter came up with the idea to stake out the hotel and wait for her to show up. I resisted at first. I'm no private investigator. I'm more like a bumbling Inspector Clouseau. But in the end, I needed to know the truth. So we set up in the lounge bar and I started pounding back drinks, hoping I was wrong. Around 6.30, Peter nudged me. There she was, checking in at the front desk, not in her work uniform. I didn't know if I wanted to scream, cry, or throw something. We waited for her to take the elevator up, then headed to the front desk. I asked them to put me through to her room. When she picked up, I just exploded. I yelled into the phone, telling her it was over, that I was done, and the wedding was off. Then I hung up and stormed out of there. Now, I had no idea where to go. I ended up crashing at Peter's place. My phone was blowing up non-stop, but I didn't answer anyone. The only person I called was my dad. I explained things to him in the most PG-rated way I could manage and told him I had to leave town for a bit. It wasn't up for discussion, and I felt bad for how I spoke to him. The calls kept coming for the next two days, from everyone under the sun, but I ignored them all. I didn't know what to do or how to feel. It was like I was walking around in a fog, completely underwater. Peter mentioned I should start thinking about the financial side of things, protecting myself. Honestly, that hadn't even crossed my mind. The house, the wedding, the car loans, we had separate accounts, plus one for wedding expenses and another for the house bills. But I couldn't bring myself to care. The next day, I emailed Jessica, telling her this would be our last contact. I said I was leaving the city for a while and called off everything. The wedding, the relationship, all of it. I also called my dad back and had a long conversation with him. He was crushed, of course, but he understood I needed space. He still hoped we could work things out. But I knew better. Ten days later, I hopped on a plane to Bali. I never responded to Jessica's messages or anyone else's. I didn't even care if she left the hotel that night or stayed. It didn't matter anymore. In Bali, I spent a solid month drowning myself in booze and staying offline, except to check in with my dad and my job. 
I didn't even care if I got fired. I wish I could say I enjoyed my time there, but honestly, I was just angry, ashamed, and filled with hate over how everything went down. After three weeks, Peter called me to ask if I could swing by Tokyo to handle some business. We also talked about the new virus that was starting to make headlines, and I thought about going back to Canada to settle things since there were already rumors about potential lockdowns. I landed in Tokyo on March 1st, and honestly, it felt good to be back at work, even if it was just for a short while. After hearing all the chatter about upcoming lockdowns, Peter mentioned I should think about heading back to Canada, but I brushed it off. I figured, eh, it'll only be 30 to 60 days, tops. I need more time to figure out my next move. Well, 30 to 60 days turned into, well, a whole year. I ended up staying in Japan until I could finally get vaccinated. By that point, I wasn't in any rush to go home. My house was rented out, I was keeping in touch with family, but I flat out refused to hear anything about Jessica. I just didn't want to go there. Then, on September 21st, I got a call. My dad had a heart attack. He was stable, but he'd need a triple bypass. And while the surgery is a lot safer now than it was decades ago, it's still major. I knew I had to get home to see him, just in case. But man, I also knew going home was going to be a complete nightmare. I didn't want the drama, didn't want to deal with any of it. I just wanted to see my parents and thank Peter for everything he'd done for me, even with how selfish I'd been. But yeah, I knew I'd have to face her eventually. And to be honest, I had no idea how I'd feel or react. I'm sorry for how long this is. Really, even though I've tried to cut it down, there's still so much I left out. Anyway, I'm flying out in 4 hours and should be landing in about 24. Update after I landed, I went straight to see my dad. He actually looked pretty good and was even looking forward to the surgery. My mom was holding up well too, but I could tell she was masking her worry. I spent the better part of the next 24 hours by his side, and we talked about everything under the sun. Nothing too heavy though, I didn't want to add any stress. I told him I was there for him, but I was also using this trip to figure out my life, to close some doors and open new ones. On the second day, Peter and I met up at a bar near the office. As usual, he was already hitting the booze pretty hard. We caught up a bit, talking about my dad, work, and then he asked the inevitable, had I spoken to Jessica? I told him no. Then he dropped another bomb. The old man, the boss, wanted to see me, but he said, considering everything with my dad, it could wait. I figured I was already in deep, so I told him we might as well just get it over with. I had a whole list of things to tackle this month, and facing the boss was one of them. So was meeting Jessica. May as well start crossing things off. Walking into the office felt surreal. It had been so long, and a lot of familiar faces were gone. New ones in their place. A few people nodded or greeted me, but it felt different. We went up to the old man's office, and I'd never been there before. As we walked in, he motioned for us to sit. Now, I'd never spoken to him one-on-one, -on -one, but I'd seen him around. People parted like the Red Sea when he walked the floor. He started off with a typical formal greeting. Good morning, gentlemen. This is a closed meeting. Everything discussed here is confidential. You know, the usual corporate blah, blah, blah. But then he launched into a full-on rant about responsibility and dedication. He made some solid points, I'll admit. Then he turned to Peter and asked why they should bother keeping me around. Peter didn't skip a beat. He said I did great work, saved accounts, and brought in new ones. And then he casually threw in, plus, we can't find anyone else who'll do the job for 20% below market salary. What the hell? I felt a little blindsided by that. But before I could react, the old man and Peter started laughing like they were in some scene from Goodfellas. The old man wiped a tear from his eye and said to Peter, that's why you're the best VP I've got. I mean, sure, 
I make a decent salary, but come on, man. Then the old man leaned in, looked me straight in the eye, and said, Listen, kid, I know you've had some woman troubles, so let me give you a piece of advice. He quoted some guy's name I didn't catch, but the gist of it went like this. God gives women eyebrows, and she plucks them out and draws on new ones. God gives her a face, and she paints over it. God gives her a body, and she wears clothes to change it. If God himself can't please her, what makes you think you can? So, don't kill yourself trying. I gotta say, that one left me speechless. The old man turned to Peter and said, I trust you'll handle this properly. Your mother would kill me if I had to fire you. And then it hit me. Peter and the old man were related. As we walked out, I turned to Peter and said, 20% below market. Huh? Really? He threw his arm around me and said, don't worry. I've got you covered. Then I asked, so, am I getting fired or disciplined? He just grinned and said, no. Dumbass. You're getting promoted. And then, like it was nothing, he kissed the side of my head and added, I missed you, kid. Now let's go get wasted. It's 8.30 in the morning, Peter. Who drinks this early? I asked. He just laughed. I do. You've still got a lot to learn about enjoying life. Honestly, with Peter, none of this surprised me. This is the same guy who once got drunk on sake, picked a fight with a monkey at a hot spring in Japan, and lost. We ended up getting properly hammered that day, talking about work and everything that had been happening. Then, naturally, the conversation shifted to Jessica. Peter told me that if I wanted to move forward, I needed to get closure. We'd both made mistakes, he said. But we were good people deep down. He believed that once I got the closure I needed, I'd be able to move on without all this emotional baggage weighing me down. He also said that once that was behind me, we could talk about my future at the company, where I wanted to go from here and what I wanted to do. So that's another thing checked off my list. At least I still have a job. My dad's looking better, but I still can't get Jessica out of my head. It's been haunting me. I unblocked her on Facebook, scrolled through her profile, trying to mentally prepare for what was coming. I sent her a message asking if we could meet for dinner sometime soon. We exchanged a few pleasantries and set a date for a couple of days from now. Jessica and I are meeting at a restaurant a few hours after she gets off work. Heading into this dinner, I had two big fears. Either I'd be too angry and let that control me, or worse, that my feelings for her would still be too strong and I'd act on that. I was hoping to find some middle ground, some kind of balance in the gray area. But all my careful planning went right out the window the moment she walked in. She looked incredible, like nothing had changed. She smiled as she walked over, and I could feel my stomach doing flips. I swear, I wasn't even this nervous when we lost our virginity together. We shared a brief, awkward hug, and I could smell the perfume she used to wear, the one I'd always loved. My mind immediately started spinning. Is she here to love bomb me? To play some emotional game? Maybe she's in a new relationship and just wants to flaunt it. Remind me of what I lost. I noticed there was no ring on her finger, not even the one I gave her. We started with small talk. She asked about my dad, told me how she checked in on him during her shifts, and reassured me that his surgeon for the bypass was one of the best. Then we talked about her workload during the pandemic and my time in Tokyo during the lockdown. On the outside, I kept calm and collected, but on the inside, I was barely holding it together. I kept telling myself I needed this conversation, needed to finally get these feelings out and move on. But we danced around the real issue for what felt like an eternity. Then, finally, her expression shifted, and I could tell the conversation was about to get heavy. The rest of the conversation is a blur, but I'll try to recount it as best I can. She started, first, I want to tell you how sorry I am for everything that happened and for hurting you. I shot back, are you sorry because you got caught? 
Or are you actually sorry for what you did to me? Of course, I'm sorry for what it did to you, she said, looking down, for what it did to our lives and our future. I threw it all away because of my own insecurity. So was that your plan from the beginning? Was it really because you were insecure? Or did you secretly want to punish me for being with other people when we weren't together? Maybe both, she admitted. But I can tell you this, none of the men I was with before we got engaged, I never loved them the way I loved you. My ex cheated on me because he said he could never compete with how I felt about you. That's why we broke up. That was news to me. I hadn't known about that. And honestly, I never felt bad about my ex cheating. She continued, I never wanted you to find out I was going to sleep with another man. I thought I could keep it separate that I could emotionally detach. And even if you did find out, I figured we could work through it like we always had before. You thought wrong. I told her, my voice tightening. It was probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced. I didn't need you to be perfect, Jessica. I didn't need you to have experience. I just needed you to be mine. Every single one of those other women, none of them even came close to what I felt with you. But now I'm starting to wonder, was it ever real? Was it the actual love we shared? Or was it just the dream we projected? The fantasy our families wanted? Things got emotional. Jessica excused herself to the bathroom to collect herself. We were in a medium-sized restaurant, and only a few tables were occupied. Peter had tagged along for moral support, like some of you suggested, and was hanging out in the sealed-off lounge area. I glanced over to him for some encouragement, maybe a thumbs up. But he was deep in conversation with two attractive women, laughing, gesturing, the whole bit. He finally caught my eye, gave me a thumbs up, then smirked and flipped me off before turning back to his extracurricular activities. Typical Peter. Jessica came back, and we picked up where we left off. Is there anything you want to ask me about that night? She asked. It doesn't matter. What's done is done. Nothing happened, she said quickly. I wasn't even sure I could have gone through with it. When you called the room, it scared the crap out of me. I raced down to the lobby, but you were already gone. It doesn't matter now, I said, shaking my head. I'm not here to dig up the past. What I want to know is, can we move forward from this? Her voice wavered. Can you forgive me? Of course I can forgive you, and I do forgive you. You're not a terrible person. You just made some terrible choices that brought us here. It's not entirely your fault. I should have been more open, more understanding of your worries. I could feel myself cycling through emotions. Love, anger, regret, one after another. Part of me wanted to lash out, to scream at her, but another part of me just wanted to take her home and forget any of this ever happened. In the weeks leading up to this conversation, I'd been watching these Reddit videos on YouTube, stories about men punishing themselves for what their partners had done, torturing themselves more than the actual betrayal. I was determined not to be that guy. I glanced at her, remembering what the old man had said. Her painted face, the perfectly manicured nails, the tight-fitting dress. It all made me wonder, do I really even know her? Is her mind as fake as the rest of this? I steeled myself and asked, so what now? Is there a future for us? Jessica lowered her voice, her eyes softening. I want you to remember when we were kids, walking home from the park, and that vicious dog came after us. I instinctively stepped in front of you to protect you, to save you. It only lasted a few seconds, but when you're nine, that's terrifying. She nodded, remembering. All these years later, Jessica, I've stood in front of you, loving you, protecting you from whatever came our way. And this time when I put myself out there, when I gave you everything, you stabbed me in the back, just like the frog and the scorpion that hit her hard. She dropped her head and started to sob. I wasn't done yet. I'm sorry, she whispered, barely audible, and pulled out the ring box, sliding it across the table. I left it there. 
I don't want it, I said, my frustration boiling over. Do you think I want to be sitting here with my heart in my throat while you cry? I want to be home, playing with the baby we would have had by now. Her sobs got louder, her hands covering her face. I've said some pretty horrible things in my life, but that one, yeah, I apologized, realizing I'd gone too far. That moment snapped me out of my anger, and things finally calmed down after that. We had a more normal conversation about life, the future, nothing too deep. Since our parents are so close and her family is like my second family, we talked about how we could move forward as friends. Reconciliation, that wasn't even on the table. When it was time to leave, we hugged, and it felt like we held on for a long time. 